So we've got two readings from the New Testament today. The first one is from the letter of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scriptures say, God yearns jealousy for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives all the more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but give grace, gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you double-minded. So the, the other New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be, is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Here ends the reading. So this week, we're looking at part of the letter of James again. And traditionally, the author of James is thought to be James, the brother of Jesus. And we don't know a lot about why this letter is written, but we can figure out some of what must have been going on for people in the first century church. So if we, if we look at the letter as a whole, the first thing we can put, pick up on is the church is under a lot of strain. James mentions persecution or enduring suffering a number of times, and those are two of my least favorite things. Persecution and suffering are obviously very stressful. And when people are stressed, they tend to not act their best or make ideal decisions. Sometimes when we're stressed, we end up fixating on the wrong things and are more prone to taking out our feelings on people around us as our capacity to deal with life is diminished. This stressed place is where the church in James seems to be. And the wrong thing the people are fixating on is status. People are getting obsessed with their social positions and power, and that makes sense when you think about it. In times of uncertainty, people often get protective of the stuff they've got for fear it might get taken away. Now, this is causing a lot of divisions in the church because churches have all sorts of people in them who all have different incomes and social positions. 
So people in the church are treating the richer members better than the poorer ones. And the rich members of the church were lording their status above everyone else. So James isn't talking to an ideal church community here. He's writing to a stressed, divided, hurting, and probably worn out bunch of Christians who aren't treating each other particularly well. So on one level, this entire letter is James saying, stop it, and can't we all get along? But he also has some uh, punchy points to back that up. The overarching concept is that as people of faith, we should have integrity and consistency. Our faith should inform all that we do and should dictate what we care about. If everyone is fighting about social position and power, then the church isn't valuing what God values. They're just saying they're following Christ and then actually following the idols of money or power. James explains this by saying there's wisdom from above and wisdom from below, or friendship with God and friendship with the world. So we've got God's wisdom and the world's wisdom. Now the the term world is a little bit confusing. When James uses world, he's talking about like the values of like human society rather than like creation in general. So he's not talking about creation, that creation is bad. Uh, James is talking about how the values of human society often don't line up with what God values. Those contrary values he labels the world. We also need to talk a little bit about the word friendship. Uh, friendship here has a particular meaning that it, it doesn't have for us. Many of us are friends with people who believe and think differently than we do. I know my friends and I don't agree about lots of things from faith to politics. But in James's time, friendship, the way he's talking about it, had a particular meaning where if you were friends, it meant you saw things the same way and had the same outlook. It meant you and your friend were in pretty much total agreement. So that's why he sets things up as friendship with God versus friendship with the world. In this idea of friendship, you can't be friends with both. You can't align your life around two different sets of values. You have to pick one. Uh, The church is called to value what God values. The kingdom values are sometimes what we call them. And as Christians, we're called to live, value, and proclaim things like love, justice, mercy, kindness, service, selflessness, generosity, hope, and peace. And we're called to proclaim those things and live them out in a world that lifts up things like war, might makes right, selfishness, greed, power, and wealth. If you know the hymn, they'll know, they'll know we are Christians by our love, That's essentially the call of the church. We're called to live differently in such a way that people know we are Christians. We're called to follow God's wisdom in a world that values much different things. The church in James's letter is having divisions and fights because they're being double-minded. They're trying to be friends with God and friends with the world. They're trying to live by the world's values to get ahead in society and then live by God's values at other times. And trying to be two different things is a recipe for failure. Healthy life and healthy faith involves being whole people, having one set of values govern our lives. And that's particularly true when God's wisdom or kingdom values differ a lot from the world's values. Just like we can't be two places at once, we can't center our lives around two different value systems. We need to be single-minded, rather than double-minded. Jesus, in the Gospel lesson from Mark, is teaching the disciples a very similar lesson. We pick up with him while he's telling the disciples a second time that the Messiah is going to undergo suffering and death and on the third day rise. Now for us, that Jesus is going to die and then rise again, that's not earth-shattering news. We've heard this story before. But this was shocking news for the disciples. Their understanding of the Messiah involved the Messiah being very much alive and rescuing Israel by probably kicking out the Romans and reestablishing an independent kingdom of Israel. 
There wasn't room in that concept for a Messiah who suffered and died. The disciples were thinking about the Messiah in terms of the world's wisdom and conception of power. But God's wisdom runs counter to that. So Jesus tells the disciples he's going to suffer and die, and they just don't understand. And none of them are brave enough to ask him. Instead, they start fighting among themselves on who's the greatest. And you can even see that as them fighting over who would be in charge after Jesus was gone. They're living by the world's values instead of kingdom values. They want to follow Jesus, but they're still following the ways of the world. Like the church in James, they're having problems with double-mindedness. So Jesus tries to get through to the disciples with an object lesson. He sits them down and tells them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he takes a child and places the kid at the center of them and says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. So Jesus is doing a lot with those couple verses. Broadly, he's saying that God's wisdom isn't the world's wisdom. For God, being great means serving other people, and not just some people, all people. He says you should be servant of all to truly be first. Now, society in this time was very hierarchical, and uh, households had a definite pecking order for social status. So being the person that is the servant of all, that's the lowest and least on the social totem pole. And it's the last thing anyone would want if they're following the world's wisdom. The more people who served you meant you were more important. It's kind of like today how we often judge the importance of someone's job based on how many people report to them or how many people are under them. But God's ways are not our ways. To be first, one must be servant of all. And to hit that point home, Jesus brings a child into the group and highlights the importance of welcoming children. Now, our more modern sentimentalizing of children and childhood can cause us to miss why welcoming a child is such a, a powerful and countercultural thing for Jesus to do. Now, people have always loved their children, but in Jesus' day, children were on the, the low, nearly the lowest rung of the, the social ladder. Think about that saying, children should be seen and not heard, and you're kind of on the, tra on the right track for generally how children were thought of. Kids didn't have any rights or social status, and small children weren't able to meaningfully contribute to the functioning of the household. Plus, infant and child mortality were high. So a child was an extremely vulnerable member of society. And even today, children are vulnerable in a lot of the same ways. Children can't vote, and what rights kids have are very much tied up in the rights of their parents or guardians. And as a child, you often don't have much agency. And children also have a limited number of ways to get help should something not be right at home. And some of the time, when kids manage to report to an adult that something isn't right, they aren't believed. A lot might have changed since Jesus' day, but children are still among the most vulnerable members of our society. Jesus bringing that child into the midst of the disciples was him showing them that being servant of all means welcoming and valuing the vulnerable people society often forgets. The people who are dismissed by society are precisely the ones God values. Jesus is showing that these lives matter to God. Being God's people involves valuing the people God values, which means welcoming, loving, and supporting the people the world dismisses. Every single person is made in the image of God, and every single person, no matter who they are or what society says about them, matters to God. Now, throughout the, the gospel, the disciples are quite bad at following God's wisdom and constantly get distracted by the world's wisdom. And that's actually good news for us. Being single-minded in following kingdom values in a world that often values opposite things is 
really hard. The disciples constantly needing to work at things shows us that it is okay when we fall short. There is grace for us when we do. But it does matter that we keep trying to orient our lives along those kingdom values of love and service. And the whole reason in the Gospels Jesus preaches about repenting or turning around is precisely because change and second chances are possible for all of us. We all have the capacity to become more and more who God has called us to be. And God is not done with us or with this world yet. No matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, or what society says about you, the promises of God, the kingdom of God, and the love of God are for you. And at the end of all things, we're promised that those kingdom values will indeed be what the world values. And there will be no more hunger or pain or mourning. And God will dwell among us and wipe away the tears from all faces. Amen.